It gives me great pleasure to introduce our honorary degree recipient, Dr. Gus Casely Hayford, OBE, to whom we award an honorary doctorate. Dr. Gus Casely Hayford is the inaugural director of VNA East, a professor, curator, and cultural historian who writes lectures and broadcasts widely on culture, but he identifies himself first and foremost as a champion of the arts. Beginning his illustrious career as a student at Central School of Art and Design, now Central St. Martin's UAL, Gus was inspired by his earliest creative encounters in the mid-1980s, what he refers to as the gilded era of menswear, including his elder brother, Joe Casely Hayford, John Galliano, and many others. He fondly reminisces on the young Galliano's audacious weaponization of menswear, turning the suit into a canvas for deconstructing the ambient politics and culture. This educational upbringing would lead Gus into a lifetime of studying and contributing himself, using art as a way of co commenting on cultural zeitgeists. Gus went on to become the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, the most comprehensive collection-based museum and research center dedicated to African art in the world. He was also director of art strategy at Arts Council England and director of the INOVA. In addition to offering his leadership to both large and medium scale arts organizations, Gus has presented and written the companion book for two television series of the Lost Kingdoms of Africa for the BBC, two television series of Tate Britain, Great Art Walks for Sky, and has worked for every major British TV channel. He continues to work as an arts and cultural lecturer at Southbees Institute, Goldsmiths, Birkbeck, City University, University of Westminster, and SOAS. In 2018, his contribution to the arts was formally acknowledged when Gus was awarded an OBE. Amongst a large range of honors and awards for his achievements in the arts, he's also been awarded a King's College Honorary. Today, UAL honors his lifetime of work and contribution to art. I'm delighted to invite the Chair of Governors to confer the Honorary Doctorate of the University of the Arts London on Dr. Gus Casely Hayford. Thank you. Can I begin by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. I am deeply, deeply, profoundly honored to receive this. And thank you to everyone at UAL, to James, to Andrew, to the governors, to all of you who make UAL what it is and who have made this possible. I just want to say thank you because careers aren't built alone. This is about all those teachers, those friends, those mentors, those guides who've helped me across my career. And particularly to my beautiful family who've invested their encouragement, their love, their good faith in me, thank you. And thinking about all of the wonderful people, the wonderful and generous people who've helped and inspired me over the course of my career has given me time to muse upon how lucky I've been, how fortunate I've been. I actually grew up in a very untrendy bit of London, right out in the suburbs. And it was long before those neighborhoods were conferred with any level of coolness because of the connection to sort of a young generation of musicians who also grew up there. It was a place that even in childhood felt really far away from everything. We lived on the street where the buses terminated. At first, I absolutely adored it. I loved the neighborhood, the sense of sleepiness, and that sense that everyone looked out for everyone else. But slowly in teenage, I began to begrudge the quiet, suffocating quiet. I grew to dislike the quality of suburban tranquility that sits so in tension with the young. And the world just felt so far away. And then one winter afternoon, I was laying on the radiator with our cat when my brother Joe came into the living room and he sat down on the floor beneath me and he pressed his back up against the radiator. And I watched over his shoulder as he opened a lined exercise book and he began to draw. His hand briefly lingered above a blank page before dropping like a bird of prey, leaving a single confident line 
that turned into a woman's arched back. A little, a little additional pressure on the pen nib suggested the weight of her torso as she, as she inhaled. A subtle twist of the barrel of the pen with his index finger rendered the silhouette of her ribs pressed against the bias of her dress. With another line, he captured her arm in motion with her wrist snapped back. It was like a swan's neck. Three simple lines on a white page, yet somehow he conjured an animate being. And it wasn't consciously clever, not formally learned, not a party trick. This was pure talent, and I watched in utter awe. How could a human conjure something of such completeness, such beauty? Even the cat was totally mesmerized by it. It was a moment when I felt the universe just lean a little in my direction. And I realized that talent and imagination were a terrain of exploration in themselves. That some, that some of what one might call dreams, these were things that might actually be attained. These were diamonds that might be mined, collected, and deployed. And so from that day on, I watched my brother with a keen eye. I learned from his drive, his appetite for life. I learned from his passion for everything. Everything that was visually interesting, he sucked in. I watched how, even when he wasn't being creative, he gravitated toward things that were beautifully engineered, crafted, made, things that were selected to understand how fabric, how anatomy, how ergonomics impacted the world around us. When he rode his bike, it was to feel how materials resisted the shifting ambience, how things felt in the air. The world was his laboratory, and he would deploy all the tools at his disposal for his singular goal to understand and capture undeniable beauty. But more than all of that, I watched how he cherished and he honed his dream. And when he went away to St. Martin's School of Art, I missed him, but I would follow vicariously in the stories that he brought home through the drawings and the swatches of fabric that followed in his portfolio. And he was, as Andrew said, one of a gilded generation of designers who graduated from St. Martin's in the 80s. I would hear about John Galliano and Alistair Blair, about Rifat Osbeck, but even from, within, even from within this group, he knew that he was part of a dazzling chapter in menswear history. And though I was still a child, when I first saw their work, I knew that this was something that was truly special. And even when I was to go on to Central School of Art and on to become an academic, and on to work in television and then in museums, and even decades later, when I was leave, to leave Britain to run one of the Smithsonian Museums. And even in mourning the tragic loss of my dear brother, it would be these anchoring foundational lessons of looking for creative opportunities, wherever that they might be, of the mining of the world for beauty, and of the profound power of dreaming these would be the things that would repeatedly return to me and anchor me when I needed them. And when I later considered taking American citizenship, it would be in part the spirit of those foundational memories that would eventually lure me home. I was made in Britain, crafted here in London, fashioned here by its streets, its atmosphere, inspired by its tertiary educational systems, particularly by this great institution. And I am so deeply proud of that. Coming to study at UAL, I learned not just facts and skills, but something of this nation's creative spirit, of our values, of the things that we deem important, of education and tradition on the one hand, but also respect for irreverent, radical, raw talent for the fostering of spaces where the young might explore, experiment, and dream, and dream, and dream. And today, in my deeply privileged role of being part of a team tasked with crafting a new national museum, 
I'm determined that we will reinvest in that beautiful circle, that V&A East be will become a crucible of opportunity for a new generation, that we will be a platform for dreamers and we'll spread opportunity wherever we can, and we will also spread the belief in giving back. And one of my most pleasurable parts of, of the job that I do at the moment is getting out of the museum and into schools, some of the hundreds of schools that surround our site in East London that I've made a commitment to visit. And I feel far more inspired than the young people that I spend time with taking objects to by their energy, by their belief, by their creativity. I consistently come away from those sessions charged, reinvigorated by their energy. And I see that. I feel that energy here. Before I came in, I sat on the South Bank and I watched you with your families and I could feel that sense of creative energy, of optimism. We feels like a space of ferocious talent, UAL of great potential, I can feel it here, yet to be unleashed upon the world. Please don't lightly compromise on your dreams. Dream and dream and dream until the world yields to your beauty. We live in a time starved of dreams. A new AL, this crucible of aspiration, feels like a life jacket, in a, be a beacon in a storm. Dreams are critical to our shared future. And if anyone ever asked me for a one critical piece of advice, I would say dream, work hard, be scarily nice, and dream and dream and dream. Compromise occasionally, but always on the road to a bigger dream. And can I end by saying congratulations to everyone being honored today. And thank you to all of the staff, to the parents and friends who are here to support them. No career is crafted without support, without love, without companionship. And I'd like to thank everyone who supported me, you, and everyone creative. I'm deeply, profoundly, humbly honored and grateful to receive this. Thank you.